Okay, awesome. So welcome. So my name is Vanessa. I've been developing leaders for over 20 years. And, um, you know, I feel like, I feel like we are now at a tipping point in the world. I feel like that with all that's happening, many of us have been taught to grow up in this world filled with a lot of hatred and fear for other. And I feel like we're at a tipping point where we're all realizing that there's a different paradigm, that there's a paradigm where instead of hate, we can live our lives filled with love and compassion and caring for others. And because I develop leaders, um, I, I want to, let me, let me just reverse a little bit. There's two reasons why I wanted to do this webinar, or this, have this conversation today. First of all, because I develop leaders. And it's a passion of mine. And I feel like it's a personal responsibility that all of you who are today are leaders, that we all take a stand for what we believe in. And I have a platform to take a stand for what I believe is right. And that's what today is about. It's about all of us developing a new kind of leadership. And the second reason this is really important for me today is because anyone who's experienced an ism before knows how much it hurts. Um, as a woman, I've, I've experienced sexism. Um, I am someone who's Jewish and I've experienced anti-Semitism. Anti anti you know, if I think about the history of, of Jews, we've been persecuted for years, thousands of years. I have family who died in the Holocaust. The whole town of Shkud, Lithuania, where my great grandparents lived, was demolished in the war. Um, and and anti-Semitism is alive and well in Toronto today. A couple of weeks ago, there was a swastika written right in front of my kid's school in chalk, and that is not okay. And every time something like that happens, it hurts. It hurts. It breaks my heart. And so anyone who's experienced any ism knows it breaks your heart. Now, as a Jew who has white skin, I can walk around the world and I can hide my Judaism from anti-Semites. But for my friends and colleagues whose skin is black, you cannot hide from racist people. And that breaks my heart. And so today, this is a platform for us to talk about anti-racism and what it means. And I'm, I'm thrilled. You know, I have to be honest with you all. I had to upgrade my Zoom account because so many people wanted to be here today and that gives me so much life. Vanessa, you're muted. <laughs> Okay, so um, when all the riots were happening in the States, I, I called my friend Audrey. Audrey and I have known each other for years. And I said to Audrey, um, you know, I need to talk to you about what's happening with all the race riots in the States and what we can do in Canada. And, and Audrey and I got on the phone, we had a beautiful chat. And I said to her, let's share this conversation with more people. And I also said to Audrey, you know, you have three daughters. How are they feeling about everything happening in the world right now? And Audrey said, let's invite my, my daughter, Courtney, to, to share her experiences. So I really wanted to, um, I thought it'd be really powerful to share the multi-generational experience of racism in Canada today. So we're gonna do that. And I'd like to introduce my guests. Um, so Audrey Forbes is a senior vice president a member experience at OP Trust, a jointly sponsored defined benefit pension plan assets with assets of almost $22 billion. So in her role, Audrey oversees the pension administration function serving 96,000 people. She joined uh, OP Trust in Jan 2001 and has held many positions over the years. She's a master's degree, in public administration from Queens, a bachelor's in business admin from York, is a certified employee benefits specialist, and she serves on many local boards. She's very involved in her community and with her faith. And, and those are just some of the reasons why I love Audrey. Um, let me introduce Courtney, her daughter. So she's a freelance commercial photographer. She studied communications at Laurentian University and creative photography at Humber. Throughout her youth, she's been incredibly cause-driven, one of the reasons I love Courtney, and this passion has followed through into her adulthood. Courtney loves all things arts and culture and is currently launching her photography business. 
So Courtney doesn't know that I'm about to say this, but if anybody has any connections with commercial photography, could you please email me? Let's get her business going at the end of this, okay? Can we do that together? Okay, so without further ado, um, Audrey, let's start with you. And then Courtney, um, you can answer the same question. Why is, let, let's talk about um, defining um, anti-racism and that movement. What is that all about? So Vanessa, before, before we get started, um, uh, one of the, the lovely challenges of working from home is that um, my computer just got unplugged. So let me just plug that in, in really quickly before we get going so I don't run out of charge. Uh, in the middle of the conversation. So uh, this is this is against all of the ethic uh, etiquette, but let me just plug my computer back in. Okay, so Courtney, well, let's, start with you. Yeah. 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 let's start with you. Yeah, so uh, in in today's climate, we're obviously seeing a lot of, uh, we're, we're exposing a lot of the ways that racism oh, no, is happening quietly. Um, so in, in, in being anti, no, me so being anti-racist is very, very, um, very active, um, and it goes a lot beyond being individually not racist, which can kind of be a little bit of a neutral, a neutral position to racism. Whereas um, anti-racism, like I said, is is an incredibly active role of um, being against it. So that's what it is to me. Uh, and Audrey, what does it mean to you to be anti-racist? Right. So, uh, so Vanessa, before before I, I, I go to that, if I, if I may, if I just uh, may just go back a little bit and um, comment on two things, and I know Courtney has a perspective on this too, uh, and that is today our conversation will focus on uh, the Black experience, the Black people, and our experiences. Um, and so you'll you'll hear you'll notice that we're not touching on Indigenous matters or other marginalized groups. I don't want you to think that that's not important. That has a role, a stage, and it should, it, is, it deserves a conversation of this gravity. But today we're focusing on the Black experience. Um, we have one hour and we can't boil the ocean. So that's our focus today. Just want to put that out there. The other thing I want to mention, I think Courtney has, a, has another way of putting it. Courtney says, well, go ahead, Courtney, say what you told me earlier. Oh, yeah. So um, when we talk about... Uh anti-racism or this this whole conversation in general um racism is a multifaceted thing it's 400 years old it exists in a million systems and affects us on a daily basis um we're two canadian black ladies and we've got one hour so i don't know how much we can really uh tackle and dismantle but uh a lot of today is about um just being aware of nonviolent racism what it means to be anti-racist so that the um the little ways that we can change on our day-to-day -day basis um, can lead to big changes. So that's where right. I'm at. The other thing really quickly that I want to mention just in terms of setting this up is that neither Courtney nor I are experts in this area. We haven't studied this and um, we are two, like she said, two black women who are community members, we are neighbors, co-workers, and uh, there is an urgency, there is a tide of, of change that, that's uh, rolling through the world and it's an opportune time, a great time to jump in on this conversation. And I do know that there are many of my co-workers, white friends, and non -white, other non-white, uh, non-black persons who want to help but don't know where to start. And that's really the essence and the crucible of this, this conversation. So you had asked me, uh, uh, Vanessa, what does it mean to be anti-racist? It really means, like Courtney said, to be actively uh, not racist and to understand what it means to be racist. And so the conversation today really is helping, helping individuals within this, this webinar to understand that there are daily kitchen table activities, everyday activities that are going on and are taking place and people are not aware that they might be supporting and giving effect to this racist system that is being per perpetuated. So it's, it's important for us to help other individuals who want to make a change understand what those things are that might be creating and supporting the system. So for me, there are three, the challenge today are three things. One of them is understanding that systemic racism is, is, is real. It's not just a minor um, inconvenience or uh, minor hurts and, and minor uh, disappointments. It is real, it's fundamental, it's, it's affecting education, it's affecting healthcare, it's affecting economic outcomes, it's affecting uh, people's livelihoods. It is real and it, we'll demonstrate that today. That's number one. The second thing is 
what's at stake for all of us? And um, like I said before, it's lives being destroyed. But if, if we don't make the effort to fix this today, this is what we're bequeathing to our, to our children to, so to solve. This is the legacy that we're leaving for our children to figure out and our grandchildren to figure out later on. So that's what's at stake. And I'm incredibly encouraged by, Vanessa said that there's over 300 people on this call, 320 odd people on this, this webinar today, because it says to me that people are interested. They're not black people who are interested in being a part of this this uh the solution and it's it's incredibly encouraging to me so that's the second thing and the third thing is um each of us can make a difference so these are the three things i'd really love for people to come away with today everybody can make a difference and it's the little things the little casual things that really give effect to the bigger things that we're talking about today so i think that would be a really important um concept for under, us to understand is the concept of casual racism. And can you explain what does that look like in your day-to-day -day life? What would be some examples? And I know you've shared some of these with me before, and, and some of them actually made my mouth drop. Um, what are some of these examples that you've both experienced of casual racism that we might, might be surprised or not surprised to, to hear about, to learn about? Do you want to start, Courtney? Oh, sure. Um, so with casual racism, it, it looks a lot like um, it looks a lot like jokes, uh, offensive jokes or or offhanded comments or excluding people or racializing actions. Um, it's all very it's nonviolent, really, is what we're we're here to talk about. So um, it's it's very much the the day to day. Um, living your life someone says something offhanded um and it doesn't necessarily hurt you but uh it can hurt someone who is uh someone who's black or someone who is racialized in your social circle um so these look like microaggressions um which are just like indirect comments which are incredibly like hurtful or prejudiced or loaded if you will um so personal examples for me is um whenever uh i was actually talking to my mom about this last night when i was going up through school, um, every time that I had a, I scored well on a test, I was consistently accused of cheating. Um, no matter what, it was just like, what, no matter what class, what grade, um, it was always like, oh, well, you cheated, Courtney. And I actually believe that I got in a, a schoolyard fight about it once, but um, <laughs> I was consistently accused of cheating. Um, I've often had like my professionalism questioned, um, it, my, my ability to be professional, and I've never in those spaces, I've never, never done anything off cuff or, um, or, or unprofessional, um, but they're very targeted towards me and, uh, and, and not my colleagues, which often are white people, because I'm, I'm someone who operates in a lot of white spaces. So um, in those white spaces, people will turn to me and be like, well, Courtney, you know, you're representing the company and uh, you can't wear jeans to this event um, when I've never worn jeans to a workplace ever. Um, or yeah, just just things like that, where they're really like, they're incredibly targeted towards me for no other reason, um, visible reason than my race. Um, Audrey, did you want to, Audrey, did you want to speak to that? <laughs> sure, sure. Let me let me add a little bit more. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the comments that we've heard, and I've heard as well, Courtney's heard it, is uh, you're pretty for a black girl. Mm -hmm. um, th those kinds of comments are made. And, and whereas, um, like Courtney said, sometimes it doesn't seem harmful at first. On the surface, they seem very benign, but they are, and if Vanessa and I talked about this, is uh, this nonviolent racism that we talk about, it, it, it is not the stuff that make up the six o'clock news. It's not the thing that is the blood and gore, um, but this nonviolent racism, this casual kitchen table racism, this is the lifeblood of this other stuff. It's the essence of racism. It is the it's the adhesive that holds this racist system together and then it manifests itself when it's mature. It manifests itself in the stuff that hits the six o'clock news. So this nonviolent um, casual racism is extremely dangerous. It is harming people and we need to understand what that is. So Vanessa, you asked about some examples and I'm gonna start, I was thinking about this before, I'm gonna start with, with something and I'm gonna ask you to follow me through. So. For me, one of the casual uh, bits of racism that I've encountered is I work in downtown Toronto 
And um, I'll be walking down Young Street. I see a nice dress in the window. I walk in the store. And I'm sure lots of Black people on this call are nodding their heads because they know exactly where I'm going. We've all experienced it. Well, I believe we've all experienced it as Black people. I'm walking down the street, see a nice dress. I walk in the store. I feel the fabric, love it. I go to the, the clerk and I say, I'd like to try this dress on in a size 12, please. And I'd like either a green or an orange. I like bright colors. Um, turns around, and this is, I'm not making this up. This has happened many times. Clerk turns around and she says, I might have the size 12, but it is very expensive. And she stands there and, and doesn't move to get the dress because I clearly can't afford it. So, you know, when it happened at first 20 years ago or 30 years ago, I would check myself. Uh, is it my hair, my handbag, how I'm dressed? No, but I, I've tested this theory so many times that it happened in so many different spaces that I know it's because of the color of my skin. So the clerk has already decided she is black, therefore. And when you say she, is, she or he is black, therefore, you can fill that in with a thousand different things. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if I may just take another minute, Vanessa, just to bring this along a little bit more. And, and that is, um, you know, so this, this clerk, let's just say, goes away and gets study, studies and starts to teach. And so this clerk now with the same mindset is now my kindergarten uh, daughter's teacher. So she's the teacher now in my daughter's kindergarten class. And her mindset is, she's black, therefore. You're not, in, you're not capable of intellectual pursuits. You, you, you can't handle this stuff. So we'll just, we'll just keep you comfortable through school and, and we'll get you to grade, to grade eight and, and then you'll move on. And, and, and we've seen it before. We've talked to many black parents and I'm one of them where if you're not in the, in the school, talking to the teacher and, and this is not to suggest at all that, that, that people are bad. The, these teachers are not bad people, um, uh, but sometimes they don't realize, they're not aware of these actions and what they mean. And when your child is small and, and, and they're be constantly exposed to these ideas that you, can, you can't do it, you, you're not good enough, or um, you know, they're not being challenged to their full potential because someone thinks you're black, therefore you can't get very far. You get through grade eight and you, you, you fall, you, the same individual who is now was a kindergarten teacher is now in high school. And now it's my kid's teacher in high school and they're preparing for university and someone's saying, you're black, therefore, oh, you're good for a hairdresser. Yes, you could do that clerk job. You'll take these courses. You can't do university courses. No, no, uh, you're black, therefore. And I'm not gonna take this all the way through, but you see where I'm going with this. You take this to university, you take this to the workplace. And these are examples of how these small actions that seem very, very innocent end up ruining people's lives. It, it, it denies an education. It denies a livelihood. It creates anger. It really just perpetuates this horrible racist thing that see people's destinies and futures denied and damaged. So they're little things, they look little, but they're not in, in their impact. So can we talk about the impact? Um, thank you both for sharing those examples. Again, my mouth is just agape. I, I, it's, it's shocking. Um, and thank you for sharing those deeply personal examples. One of the things you mentioned in terms of the impact was that you have history of not feeling good enough. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I found that statement to be really quite interesting. What, what does that mean? Let's unpack that. Mm -hmm. So, um, like any like any therapy session, and I, I, I you know, um, uh, this might this this is uncomfortable. This is uncomfortable for us. It's uncomfortable for you. It's going to be a little uncomfortable uh, for us to sort of address that, Vanessa. We have to go back a little bit. I'm not going to get into a history lesson, but we know where this kind of started. Um, you know, there's one race that was amassing all of the wealth and and. Uh, the labor and the factors of production and it was at the expense of another race the black race and so we're the ones who came up with the short end of that stick and um, as we go as we've gone through life we've uh, heard that many times and we've seen it acted out many times that you're you're uh, you're not good enough you, you certainly can't uh, get to that particular level um, and so when you grew up when you grow up hearing that all the time and I have to say some of us are fortunate enough not to have heard it all the time in your home, but you're exposing, you're exposed to it in the classroom uh, when you go out. And um, 
that plays in your mind, it plays in your head. And in those dark days when you're not feeling good about yourself, guess what you're remembering? Not all the good things that people have said about you. What you remember is all the bad things that people have said. Oh, you, you surely can't do that. And my daughter will talk a little bit about the imposter syndrome because they've talked to me about it too. And one could think, oh, she's a senior vice president. She obviously never goes through that stuff. Well, hello, um, I have. And there are still days when I have to remind myself, I have to kind of slap myself in the face and say, Audrey, smarten up. You are capable of doing this. And um, I have to say that I've had white allies and uh, um, I have a boss who I had, um, my current boss is amazing as well, but I had a boss at, uh, at OP Trust. He's, he's my boss for about 15 years. And, um, and there are times when, when I'm not feeling good about myself and I'm not confident and he's like, get out of my office, go figure it out. And, and, and that, that, that confidence really helps, but, but you do have those moments of, you know, my goodness, can I really do this? And um, it's a legacy. And when I, when I talk about history, uh, Vanessa, is that people, are, people have gone through this emotional trauma and it is transferred from generation to generation. Um, we had a, a Black History Month a thing at work and I was sharing how, um, I, you know, when I was 21, I was like, I don't want to be like my mother because she was very strict, a disciplinarian. I'm like, I don't want to be like her at all. And, um, and then over time, I realized that, oh my goodness, I, I've learned so much from her and I am like her and she was like her mother before her and her mother before her. And that's how it transfers from generation to generation. So absolutely. Um, we do struggle with that. And so every day we wake up, we have to kind of tell ourselves. And, and when you see black people who are sometimes over assertive or uh, it's because we need to remind ourselves that we are good enough. We have a right to be here like, the, like anyone else and we're quite capable. And, and I want to throw one more thing in that I, I did share at the Black History Month event uh, at work. I, I mentioned that um, when other races were studying uh, the law and medicine and philosophy and whatever, if black people were caught with a book, things would happen. And, and um, so, so there, there's a legacy of all of that that we're working against and trying to dig ourselves out of. And so we're glad for the people who are on the call who are here to help to break that cycle. And when we get to the section on things that we can be doing differently, um, we'll talk about how each of you can help a black person to free themselves of that because it is this self-perpetuating thing and um and yes the, the feeling of not being good enough is there and very much alive and uh we have to fight against that every day um yeah so to basically reiterate um what my mother said um like i said like all the things that she went through i i go through and her being raised by her um like that imposter syndrome like and any of the women on the call in professional situations or just social situations where you feel like I'm not supposed to be here. It feels incredibly, um, it's, it's a lot of self-doubt. Um, and that feels like it's doubled because not only am I a woman, I'm a black woman. So there are these spaces where I, I um, like I said, I, I've, I've operated in a lot of white spaces throughout my life. Um, and oftentimes I felt like, or people have looked at me as though I, I definitely shouldn't be there. Um, this is not a space for you. Um, so then I start playing that back in my head and, and um, yeah, so you get this imposter syndrome. So you continually feel this self doubt um, and all of that is, and it's not necessarily always people like yelling and screaming the N word and get out of here. Or, it's just, um, it's, it's not being inclusive. It's um, othering people in those spaces. It's, it's as simple as like you cheated on that test. You didn't. You didn't uh, study hard enough. Um, you shouldn't be on this team because uh, only white girls play on this team. Um, and these are all things that I've experienced. And and really, what we're dealing with here is um, it's a lot of the systems in which we operate were built. We were were built by uh, white men traditionally. So our government was built by white men hundreds of years ago, and we still like once those systems were erected, we still operate within those systems. So we're talking about um, trying to operate in a uh, a system that is has racist undertones and overtones, um, and then talking about nonviolent racism. So we're 
um, the everyday casual comments, which support that system. Um, the neutrality towards the issue, which uh, supports that system. So we can't move forward until we unpack a lot of this whole generational, generational trauma on Black people's end, but like generational issue for all of us of, of, of racism in a system and racism as a society. Um, yeah, I don't remember what the original question was, but uh, I think that that covered it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons why I wanted you and your mom here today is to talk about the generational difference. I am an eternal optimist. So I'm seeing this wave, Audrey, that you talked about, this wave of change as something that's really optimistic. And Courtney, I'm wondering if your generation feels more optimistic at all about the future. I... I think so. I think so. I think that for a while, um, for a while, a lot of people believed, and I'll say white people because I don't think that any black people believe this, but um, a lot of white people believe that we were in a post-racial society. All of those white spaces that I was in, all of those people were not racist. Um, and they're not individual racist uh, or actively racist, but like that nonviolent racism where they're repeating statements that were taught to them by their parents, who was taught by their grandparents and their grandparents um, that they've never questioned. But I mean, personally, they don't hate me because of my skin color, but they're still holding prejudices against me um, that they've never really even realized are prejudices or realized that they need to question. Um, so the new generation, I don't want to speak for all of us, and I know there are a lot of us on this call because I did so share it on social media, hashtag millennial, hashtag social justice. Um, <laughs> so a lot of the younger generation, we are a cause-driven generation. We, uh, we're out in the streets marching for things, for climate change, um, uh, doing, doing the work, doing the work in the best way we can. So we're just trying to, I think that the base level of it is like remembering that there's still a problem, remembering to be, um, to continue to seek knowledge on the problem um, and, um, and dealing with this nonviolent racism thing. Because once we are able to, once we're able to deal with the nonviolent racism internally um, and be actively anti-racist, because that's a massive thing, once we start being actively anti-racist um, in our mindsets, in the way that we operate in society, the people who are my age that will grow up to be the next senior vice presidents aren't holding those prejudices anymore. They're not, um, they're not holding those biases and, and, not, and being conscious of, of where the biases come from um, and actively working against them. So I think that uh, the younger generation is poised to, to set up a significant change as long as we're continually seeking out information and opportunities to use that information. And I think that's why we're all here to help. It, you know, we're all here to listen so we can help make that change. Um, we're going to move into shortly some, some advice and some suggestions. Um, if anybody has a question, we're checking the chat. Feel free to type it into the chat. And I had a question come through prior to this conversation, which I'd like to address before we move into our do's and don'ts list. Um, the question was that people saying that they are colorblind is not helpful at all because it denies the inequities we experience as Black people in Canada. Would either of you be willing to talk to that question, to speak to that, to address it? So I think we can both speak to this. Vanessa, um, uh, I did know that that question came in ahead of time. Um, uh, the wonderful thing is that I think um, Oliver, my husband and myself, uh, we did a fairly good job <laughs> Uh, teaching Courtney to think for herself and so she does think for herself <laughs> so we do have slightly different perspectives on this although we we come back to the the same place um and so uh for for me I struggle with the way that's characterized um I know it's well-meaning and I know the the person who's coined that 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 term you know don't be uh, uh don't be colorblind um I understand where they're coming from and I think it's many people on this call will benefit from us sort of dissecting that a little bit because um, while the intent is um, colorblindness will mean that you're you're not addressing or not acknowledging the differences in the starting uh, positions of people and realizing that we're starting way back here and white people or non-black people are starting ahead because the hands that we were dealt or the cards that we were dealt are inherently disadvantaged and, and we're, we're starting behind, we're, we're starting from a deficit situation. So 
when they say if you're, if you're being colorblind, you're not recognizing that I, I get that. I understand it, but it, it it could be a little confusing for people who are, are trying to raise their kids to not um, racialize people. And, and, and they use that as a term, you know, to, to be positively colorblind. So um, I do struggle with, with the way that's expressed. Having said that, to the people on the call, if that's something that you, you can't wrap your head around, leave it alone. Just walk away, swim past it. There's tons of other positive things we'll say today that you can wrap your heads around. Grab a hold of that and work with that. So Courtney, why don't you just jump in and talk about your perspective? Yeah, so I'm gonna go in the um, opposite direction. So um, I'm, I, I think that the idea of being colorblind and colorblindness um, towards races is, uh, it's a dismissive statement. Um, it's in, it, it fails to acknowledge any part of the black experience or systemic racism. It basically says like, I've got my blinders on, I see you as a person, um, which is all very well and good, but like, a lot of the systems in which I operate in don't see me as a person. Racists don't see me as a person. Um, so like, it's, it's interesting to say like, oh, well, I'm colorblind and I'm not racist. So I don't understand why I'd have to, I'd have to acknowledge the fact that you're a black woman. Um, but, and then I, uh, in breaking it down, I thought about it and um, came up with kind of a, a, a parallel you don't hear anyone say that they're disabilities blind. You can't say that your disability is blind and say like, I don't see disabilities, it's fine. So, um, because that denies the significance of a person's, um, of a person's issues. Um, so if you say your disability is blind while walking up the stairs and someone in a wheelchair is at the bottom of the stairs saying, I don't know if I can get up the stairs without help. And you don't, you're saying, well, I, I don't actually see the disability. You're the same person as me then you're denying them the, the opportunity to get up to the next level. So um, it's, there's a clear difference in, in, um, in needs and lifestyles um, of, of black people. And, and in, in saying that you're colorblind, you're denying our experience, you're denying um, almost the existence of racism. Um, and that lack of acknowledgement means that you're unable to support the needs of people who have different needs than you. So another thing that I want to add on the colorblindness note, um, seeing color and seeing that I'm a racialized woman doesn't mean that, that you have to judge me for that. Judging, you don't have to judge people on that. You just have to see it, acknowledge it, say, and hear what I'm saying to you. And that's how you are able to process like, you're able to process my experience because my experience, you have to be able to empathize and add compassion to say, well, I am a white woman. I may not experience that, but this is what Courtney's going through, right? So you don't have to necessarily say like, well, Courtney's, ex <laughs> Courtney's experience doesn't really exist because I don't have um, the ability to see that color, if you will. Um, but that's where I'm at on it. So um, yeah, so it, it, it is a little bit of a dismissive statement. So. Um, going forward, I think that colorblindness is not the solution. Yeah, you know, you know, um, uh, Courtney, I, I do get your point, and really, the the, the answer re really is that we we should have been colorblind uh, 400 years ago. We weren't at the beginning, girl. No, we're not. At the beginning, if we had yeah. done colorblindness from the very get go, I promise you, we would not be in the Zoom meeting today. <laughs> right, that is correct. That is yeah. absolutely correct. You know, it's interesting because I, we were talking a little bit about Brene Brown. For those of you who don't know Brene Brown, she talks a lot about vulnerability and she also talks, and the reason I am obsessed with her is because I think as leaders, we all need to be really vulnerable. And I feel like this is a very vulnerable time for all of us. And Brene Brown also talks about shame and guilt. And I think sometimes, you know, in this unraveling of this system that has been created over four to 400 years plus, there is a lot of shame and guilt. And how do we get past that? How do we get past that? How do we just sort of embrace this vulnerable time together? What, what does that look like? So I'll, I'll jump on first. Um, so uh, some of what Courtney just said, it's just acknowledging uh, that someone is going through another a different experience, and um, we haven't touched on on a, another divisive topic, which is this white privilege thing that people are talking about. 
and, and um, really to move forward, I think people have to, uh, non-Black people have to acknowledge that uh, they do enjoy privilege. Um, and uh, that's another thing where Courtney and I come at it from two different uh, angles, but we end up at the same place. And that is um, white privilege really is um, things that you're afforded. And I'm not talking money because, you know, uh, people aren't asking for others to give their monies, money over, but we're talking about things that um, people are afforded um, it, that others aren't. And so um, uh, to sort of divest yourself of some of that privilege and really mean others, extending it to us as well. Um, so when you, th when you think about uh, one of the, I just signed up yesterday with an organization that's helping to sort of solve this issue. And um, the, one of the examples they gave is, um, and I'll talk about this in the, in the, the do's and don'ts or the, the ideas to, um, to address this issue. They talk about someone who goes to an affluent, uh, I should say affluent, just drop the word affluent. They go to um, a, a seminar and uh, you pay $200, you get into the seminar, you have a fantastic time. And at the end of the, 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 the event, there's some networking. So you do some active networking and um, you drop that you're hiring for a particular position and you pass her in your business card. You go back to your office and you start started active recruitment. And um, lo and behold, you have a, a wide array of resumes in front of you, quite an assortment actually, of resumes in front of you and very qualified people. And most of them are from this event that you just came from. You were networking and networking is a powerful tool when you're trying to find a job. Networking is also a very powerful tool when you're try looking to hire someone but the privilege of attending a function like that and the privilege of networking to get a shoe in to a, a good job is a privilege that many black people will never enjoy. I will never, uh, lots of people within my community will not have played hockey with some really affluent banker for 20 years and then be able to network with his daughter to uh, give a job. Uh, we won't have the privilege of having played golf with someone for 20 years or live in the same exclusive cul-de-sac. These are privileges that we enjoy, or sorry, that um, uh, predominantly white people enjoy that black people predominantly do not. So to move forward, I think we have to understand that there are privileges that people enjoy and we're not saying to hand over your money, but uh, recognize that, to Courtney's point about the, about the colorblindness before, recognize that there are others who are knocking at the door. They're trying to get in. They're trying to get an opportunity to get hired as well. And if we are just hiring the people who are within our circles, um, people that, like I said, we've played hockey with before and within our, within our environment and those people who, can, who are privileged enough to have attended this wonderful function and be able to network, if we're denying those opportunities and those privileges to others, that's where uh, we perpetuate the situation. So to get out of this, we have to acknowledge that these are privileges that exist and share them. Not divest yourself of them necessarily, not all of them, but share them. Open doors to others. Give a hand to someone who's trying to get in. When a Black person stands in front of one of you or myself and is, is applying for a job and trying to get in, or they've submitted their resume, they have crossed many rivers to get there. They have gone through all kinds of stuff to get there generally, not everybody, but generally. And they're, they're breaking that mold and they're trying to break that cycle and they're knocking on the door, they're trying to get in. And because they don't look like or sound like or the accent's different, if they're denied, then we don't move forward. So it's recognizing those and, and dismantling those that's gonna get us help to move forward. Courtney, you have a perspective on, on white privilege that, um, it comes at it from a different angle, but we end up at the same spot. Do you want to share that? Um, yes, but quickly before we move on, I just want to address something that um, Danny said in the chat, um, in which they agreed with me, but um, I would like to say that we, in, and they called me out and said that we should be calm, cautious to, to compare uh, race and disability. And I, I do agree with that. And I, it was a little irresponsible, but I, I, I only brought it up as a way to kind of break down that issue, just to make sure that, the, just to compare and see like the way that that's happening, just to, just to address it really quickly. And, and I don't want to bring any, uh, any, any additional ire to uh, disabled peoples. Um, but um, on, the, on the topic of white privilege, um, I, I also brought, broke this down. 
in preparing for this, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out ways to like, to, um, to take the concepts down to a base level, because a lot of, uh, a lot of people haven't thought about this before. Um, so when you hear something like white privilege as a white person, I can only imagine it just feels incredibly like targeted and um, it can be uncomfortable. So a way to think about white privilege in, in which, in which it, it does align with what, um, what my mom said um, is that in thinking about white privilege is not something that you have, it's uh, more what you don't have to go through. So, so white privilege would be something like um, not having to, you, in applying for jobs, 90% of black women I know um, have either been asked to change their name, their hair, or their demeanor. Absolutely, in, myself included. Um, where, and I don't know a lot of white people that have ever been faced with that kind of situation, um, with, been faced with, um, with having to, to change your whole identity to fit this, um, this cultural major majority um, in, in order to, to get into spaces that really are public. Um, in, like employment, like we, need, we all need employment to survive. So um, that, that's, it, it's nuts. So it's just something that you don't have to go, it, uh, in my mind, and what, an aspect of white privilege is what you don't actually have to go through and what racialized people do have to go through. Um, and there, and the, lo the list of things that, that, of extra hurdles that black people have to go through um, is incredibly long and I don't have the time. Um, but if you ever, if, if you're looking for more information, there is, uh, there's a lot of really great articles out there that break it down far better than I could ever um, claim to. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's my, my, my two cents on, on white privilege. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well articulated. Thank you. I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to a couple of articles that we posted, right? Or a couple of documents we posted at the top of the chat. One is a, a an article that Audrey, um, wrote um, called It's Not All That Black and White from her deep place of wisdom and experience. I would recommend you all read that and share it. The other thing I'm gonna request you all download now is a second document called Understanding Nonviolent Racism in which we've put together for you a list of useful links which were provided by Audrey and Courtney. Um, I've read them all, they're very, very, very powerful. Uh, the last one is actually um, one Barack Obama wrote, which some of you may have already read. Um, and on, on the other side of that document are our do's and don'ts list. So let's head over there. Um, and and um, Audrey, why don't we start with you? Would you like to pick one thing from that list that, that you'd like to start addressing, either a do or a don't? W where would you like to start? And then Courtney will come back to you to address one of the areas on that list. I'd like to start with a, a do. Um, so uh, one of them really is, and I know that there are lots of uh, business leaders on this on this uh, webinar. So um, uh, you know, and we've talked at our organization about sponsorship, and sponsorship is a powerful thing because what it does is it's it allows um, those of us who enjoy various levels of privilege, uh, whatever we, whatever strata that falls into, um, are able now to, uh, to help someone who is knocking at the door and trying to get entrance. And uh, there are lots of barriers to entry that we talked about before. So sponsorship really is um, an opportunity for um, either an organization or an individual to befriend someone or to help someone to show them the, the way to sort of help them uh, understand that there is a future. There's a, I used to travel on the GO train to work before uh, COVID and there was a wonderful ad that I saw on uh, the GO train by one of the banks and it says, a funny thing happens when you tell a kid uh, that they can succeed. They believe you. And so, um, and so it's planting those seeds and helping to nurture them and to, nur and to nourish them uh, is a powerful way of, of uh, partnering and sponsoring someone, uh, getting them uh, exposed to certain things, getting them exposed to certain possibilities, helping them to dream and to support uh, success in their lives, I think is a powerful thing. One way of actually doing this would be for um, uh, an organization like ours, for example, to maybe have um, start an investment club for kids. 
So kids of a, at a very young age can understand what investments are, starting to dream and to uh, support that by internships as well. All of those things are part of, of sponsorship, which our organization is looking into as well, but that's a powerful tool. Um, and if you're uh, an actuary, for example, or starting a math club or whatever that is, and just these tools that help to expose and plant seeds and nourish and encourage people is a powerful way of, uh, of helping. Audrey, I love that idea of helping other people to dream and dream a bigger dream for themselves. And again, I always come from this leadership lens. And I think for all of us who are leaders, um, joining all the leaders joining us for this conversation today, that's part of your job as a leader. You need to see the best in other people. You need to see their talents and be able to give them the confidence. Part of leadership is giving people the confidence that they don't don't have to grow and develop. All the good leaders that I've ever had throughout my career have done that for me. So I think it's really important for all of you leaders to, to be able to do that. And Audrey, that was such a very important point that you brought up. Thank you. Courtney, let's, let's head over to you around the do's and don'ts list. Where do you want to start? A do or a don't? Um, I think I'm going to, since Audrey did a do, I'll do a don't. Um, and I'm going to pick a big one. Um, the top of the don'ts list says, don't be silent when you see acts of injustice. Shoving them off helps to reinforce means, uh, racist mindsets and systems. Um, that's really important to me because it's, it, it really is like very much a, a main factor of being actively anti-racist. Um, being anti-racist is that, 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 that sh being strongly against it. Um, not using neutrality is an excuse to kind of uh, sit down and sit out. And it is an uncomfortable thing to do. So um, we're, we're moving forward in, um, in, in, in ways of, of uh, in, in uncomfortable ways. So and, and one of those uncomfortable ways is really just like committing to not being silent when you hear casual racism, being, not being silent when you know, like a, a microaggression that someone's pointed out to you and you say, you know, I think that might be really hurtful to Courtney or it might be really hurtful when um, so-and-so says that to Audrey. Um, and, and just taking that person aside and saying, this is something that, um, that you might want to consider re-examining. Um, this is why it's racist. This is not the way that we're going to go forward in this society. It's 2020. We're not doing it anymore. Um, so just uh, we're we're going to commit to not being silent. So don't be silent when you see any acts of injustice, no matter how small. Um, and I'm guilty of this too because sometimes it's just easier to be like, I don't have time for it today. Um, but yeah, and it, it, you don't want to, and you don't always have to come at it confrontationally. It's uh, often can be very um, non-conflict, just a, a quick note on some on behavior, letting them know that what they've said is hurtful or what they've said is racist, um, and um, may, maybe even offering a further conversation. Because the more conversation we have about this, there's more awareness there is, and the less nonviolent racism we experience. Um, yeah, we can really we can do some work if we. Uh, commit to not being silent. Audrey, can I ask you to comment on that as well? Because Courtney, what I love about what you just said is you gave us some very practical things to say or do. So mm -hmm. Audrey, can, you, can you take us further on that concept of not being silent? What are some things that we can say or do if someone says something that, that we feel is racist? What might that look like? What might that sound like? Right. So, um, so the answer is different for um, for different people because uh, Vanessa, as you know very well, um, uh, speaking truth to power can be difficult. It depends on who your interaction is with, um, and so uh, you know people have to exercise judgment, discretion, caution. Uh, but um, uh, absolutely, I think it's important for for people to find a way to de-escalate a situation. And so if someone says something to you and you know it's uh, uh, something that uh, e either a, a put down or something that is not uh, helpful, um, uh, it may not always be easy in the moment to say something, but find another time when you can say, you know, you know uh, last week when you said so-and-so, this is how I felt. And uh, I'm just breaking it down that way because um, today we're on this call not to encourage any kind of 
uh, confrontation. This is not in anger. This is about, this is almost a, a reconciliation and, and a healing period. And I think most of you are on this call because you want to do something to help. So um, I really do think it's important to, to speak up. Um, but I recognize that it can be difficult depending on who you're speaking to. Um, and then as leaders, uh, what, what we can do is listen listen actively and understand where someone's coming from and the impact of what was said or done and uh, make a commitment to change and make a commitment to uh, recognize what we've done and not repeat it for someone else. Years ago, not at this organization, I worked somewhere else and um, I had applied for a, a job as a communications officer and I didn't get the job and um, uh, I went back and I said, can you help me uh, understand you know, why I didn't get it? What things you need to work on for next time and um, so that I'm prepared. And the gentleman turned around to me and he said, uh, look at you, um, what are the members gonna think? And um, he was clearly saying that you're black or members are predominantly white, they're, they're, what are they gonna think? And I said nothing, I, I, I walked out and I, I didn't say anything. This was 20 odd, almost 30 years ago, and I'm still talking about it. So. It did something to me that I didn't say anything at the time. Um, I, I should have gone back and said something. So, so, so there will be missed opportunities as well. Um, and as soon as possible after the event, if you're able to go back and, and, and say something to someone in a very understanding way, that was hurtful. That was not helpful. It's important to speak up. I love it. The reason, one of the reasons that I asked Audrey and Courtney to send me their, their do's and don'ts was because I wanted all of you to have a takeaway this is a, print this and share it with your team, share with your family. Let's open up the dialogue and have a conversation about this incredible list here. I wanna, there's one more thing on the list I wanna um, point out, but, but first there's a comment that came in um, in the chat. There are times when speaking up can break the bonds of family members. Do you have any tips on how to approach such a sensitive situation? Beautiful question. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, um, I don't have any experience with this because Audrey Forbes is my mother and I'm her daughter and we're both black women. So um, if I talk to her about racism, she's going to be like, yeah, man, I get it. I Let me tell you about the communications position that I lost out on. Um, but there are a lot of resources coming out right now because we're in such a moment um, in, in society and socially where people are trying to be aware of racism and trying to be actively anti-racist, which I'm so proud of. Um, and I know that there are some resources out there for um, how to speak to your family. And I I don't have them right now, but I, I do have them saved somewhere. So um, I, know, I, I know that there are resources out there. So I don't think that we can speak to it right this second. Um, but if I, if I pull that together and send it to you, Vanessa, maybe we can send it out to everyone else at a, a, another time. But, um, like I said, it's one of those things where I, I'm not a white person. I don't know how it is to be on the other end of it. I know that it's uncomfortable. Um, and I know that it will be uncomfortable because once it, it's like talking about politics to your family, um, you can lose family members, you can, and, and you basically have to decide whether it's worth, um, whether it's worth uh, damaging some of those relationships for the anti-racist cause. Um, or, and a lot of it can be piecemeal. I know it's just like pick, pick, picking away at it, just bringing it up. Why do you think that way? Um, and then offering something else to re as a rebuttal and then maybe just leaving it alone for a while and then going back at it. But once again, um, not an expert. I can grab some resources, send them to Vanessa. Maybe we can send them out to everybody else. Yeah, if I that would be great. Courtney, I will, I'm going to send a follow up with a recording of this to everybody. So we'll include that resource. Yeah, for sure. Vanessa, if I could just borrow a couple words from uh, Maya Angelou, I think it was her who said, um, it, it's not what you, what you say, but it's how you make people feel. And I think if, if we come from a place within our families, if we come from a place of love and respect, um, I think it can be done within our family. We, we call each other on things. And there have been times when uh, people have misspoken within our families about a number of different things. And we call each other on things. And um, I think there's a way to do it within a family just to, again, just come from a place of love and respect and say, you know, uh, tell me more about that. A place of curiosity is also helpful. Tell me, tell me why you would say that. Why do you think that? And uh, it's okay to say, 
you know, that was acceptable before, but it is not now because we, we are more enlightened and we understand the issues. We understand the ramifications. These things can be damaging. We learned on a webinar that these small things really can escalate into bigger, uh, more material, more damaging effects. And little things like these, they mature and they become horrible things and they harm people. Like I mentioned before, uh, the, the small things that the clerk started with, it, it, it escalates and they deny education, they deny a livelihood, they deny, they put people in situations of trauma, there's mental health, there's all this stuff. So um, it is real and it is impactful. And if we bring back to the impacts and remind people of what the causation or what the, the implications are, then uh, people will listen. And I have to say, this is the tipping point in our society. I really do believe where we're moving from a paradigm of hate and otherness to a paradigm of love and a paradigm of compassion and a paradigm of caring. My phraseology that rolls around in my brain is moving from humans hating humans to humans helping humans. And I think in this time of humans helping humans, we all have to have a lot of courage to stand up for what we believe in. And you're all here for a reason. Take the information you've learned today to stand up for what you believe in. We have four minutes. Um, may I suggest, um, and I know we, we were talking about how we only have an hour, we need a day for this. But in the last couple of minutes, um, Courtney, let's start with you and then we'll go to Audrey. What, what would you like to say in conclusion? Any final thoughts that you could, and it could be again, a do or a don't or anything else. Final thoughts? Um, I, I don't know, I feel very positive. Um, so when, when the first kind of wave of shootings, police shootings and, and such happened in around like 2012 to like 2015 happened, um, I was just becoming aware of like the brutality of the situation and, and racism as a whole and how it works in a system and how much I've been ignoring it just to survive. Um, this time around with, and I mean, we all know that this whole, um, the, the global conversation was triggered by the passing of George Floyd. Um, this time around, I felt very empowered to speak. Um, whereas last time I felt very, uh, felt like I, I was uh, kind of pigeonholed and quiet, but I feel very empowered to speak because I think that there's a spirit of change happening right now. We have 200, uh, we had, I think up to 250 people on the call today. Um, and, and people want to do something about it and people want to be actively anti-racist. So I think that we're on a, on a, on the right path. We're going forward in, in the direction that we need to go forward. in. this may not be an issue when I'm senior vice president of OB Trust. I love it. I love it. All right. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> So for my, my closing, uh, closing point, Vanessa, I would say that uh, there are lots of really large problems facing humankind. There's global, uh, there's climate change, there, there are pandemics, there are all kinds of other things that we need to galvanize as a race to fight these things. Let's get away from small differences that started hundreds of years ago because of the color of someone's skin. We have the power to change. We have the power to make these choices. And now that we're aware of what these microaggressions and these small kitchen table racism things are, let's challenge ourselves, each of us, challenge ourselves to choose a different path. Check ourselves, check our unconscious biases. Oh, I well, um, I think we just had a little that's clip okay. from your mom there. That's fine. Um, a lot of it is, uh, I know what she wanted to talk about because we talked about it yesterday okay. and uh, I know her. Um, yeah, so it's a lot about checking ourselves and those unconscious biases where we're being conscious and aware of, of the fact that nonviolent racism exists. We're combating it. We're being actively anti-racist as a solution. Um, and once we kind of get this whole racism thing under control, then we can prioritize, um, we can prioritize climate change and world hunger and stuff like that. Um, not to say that we can't do all of that at once, but um, we'll have a little bit more energy to share for all of our causes as a, as a global society. Yeah. Was that what you were going to say since you're back now? <laughs> Vanessa, before you close, I just want to say one thing really quickly, and that is a huge shout out and thank you to yes. Vanessa. 
and Mosaic People Development for doing this. Vanessa, this is a, this is a really important um, uh, convergence of, of, of energy because I had gone to a Black Lives Matter rally. I came back home, I grabbed a pen and a piece of paper and I emptied my head on that piece of paper. And the next day you called me and all of this just erupted. So this is, this is great energy. I wanna applaud you, Vanessa, for walking the talk and for taking the step, you are uh, an agent of change. And I thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. And thanks for having us on. Yes, that's um, the platform. Thank you, thank you. I love you both so much. Thank you everyone for joining us and for really being an agent of change. Let's all do this together. Thanks everybody. Thanks guys. Have a great weekend. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Wow.